This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, April 5th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, UMMC and the FCC come together to champion new efforts in telehealth. And Senator Roger Wicker discusses the American Rescue Plan and corporate response to the Georgia voting laws. Then health officials provide updates on vaccine progress in the state. Plus, violence is down in Mississippi prisons. We hear from the commissioner of MDOC. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The telehealth center at the University of Mississippi Medical Center is being recognized by federal officials for meeting the rising demand of remote medicine. The center received a million dollars in federal funding last year from the FCC's COVID-19 telehealth program. The funding helped to purchase tablets and other take-home electronics so patients can monitor their health and keep in touch with physicians. FCC Chairman Brendan Carr and Mississippi U.S. Senator Roger Wicker toured the facility last week. Chairman Carr says Senator Wicker was an early advocate for telehealth at the start of the pandemic and recalled a visit to a pilot program in Ruleville. At the FCC for years, we've been supporting the build out of high speed Internet connections to brick and mortar facilities. And that work has been doing really, really good uh, accomplishments. And we're going to continue to do it. But what the senator saw was uh, a little bit around the corner about this new trend in telehealth, which was. The way I describe it now, it's, it's the healthcare equivalent of shifting from blockbuster video to Netflix. You no longer have to go to a physical brick and mortar facility to get care. With a high speed connection on a smartphone or tablet, uh, you can get access to the world's best care from anywhere, including your home. As so he pointed me up towards Ruleville, uh, where UMMC had a partnership and a pilot program going on for this exact type of thing, remote patient monitoring. And I went up there about two years ago, maybe three years ago now, met with a woman named Miss Annie uh, in Ruleville, and she showed me how she had diabetes. She woke up one morning with blurred vision. That's how she noticed she had diabetes. She wasn't seeing much progress with traditional care methods, so she got in this pilot program. They sent her home with uh, some of the same types of devices we see over here, basically an iPad and a Bluetooth-enabled blood glucose monitor. Every morning she'd prick her finger, show her her A1C levels, and give her specific advice about what to do that day. And it was her story It was that idea, it was the pilot program that the team here was working on that Senator Wicker had flagged that got us going back in Washington, D.C. at the FCC. Carr believes the expansion of rural broadband access must occur to bring telehealth practices to the forefront. He says an upcoming round of funding will help connect 220,000 rural homes in Mississippi to the Internet. The next step of this, obviously, is making sure that everybody has a connection. Because all of this is meaningless if you get home and you don't have a high-speed connection at home. Uh, So Senator Wicker has been on us at the FCC to make sure that we are prioritizing rural connectivity. We've got to make sure that every single community has a fair shot at a next-gen connection, not just our country's biggest cities. And so he put the FCC to work, and we completed a, um, a funding round last year. And about $500 million of that first funding round is coming back to Mississippi to cover 220,000 homes and businesses that today have nothing. And we're going to have a second round of funding to uh, cover some additional premises and houses. So we aren't going to stop uh, until we get everybody connected. We're making really good progress as a country, but we are not across the finish line just yet. So we've got that $500 million coming to the state that will cover 220,000 homes. We've got at least $6 million so far that's coming back to the state for telehealth. And just for my part, you know, sitting in Washington, again, want to express my gratitude uh, to the senator for being ahead of the curve on telehealth, seeing the value. It's driving down health care costs, and it's improving patients' outcome, and it was just critical uh, during COVID. So a real, real honor for me to get to get back here and express my appreciation to the, the leadership here in Mississippi. 
For Dr. Luann Woodward, Vice Chancellor at UMMC, the pandemic revealed both the need and the reach of telehealth practices throughout the state. Prior to the pandemic year, we had somewhere in the range of a little under 20,000 telehealth visits a year as part of our clinical enterprise. During the year of the pandemic, it was over 130,000, so a marked increase. And particularly during that time when really we were in the shutdown and and it was not felt that it was safe for people to come in and be in a clinic visit face-to-face if it wasn't urgent or emergent, it was a way to reach patients and to continue connect with them. So the pandemic, you know, somebody said earlier the pandemic was the worst of times. Um, I guess I should say is. It's not over yet. But it brings out, I think, during the worst of times, it kind of brings out the best in us, maybe. And the way that it's really highlighted telehealth is a very valuable and very effective tool to be able to provide health care to the patients. Um, What we have found is some of the providers, some of the clinicians who prior to the pandemic were a little bit hesitant, you know, maybe they didn't feel that their specialty fit or they would just rather see their patients in person, have, have liked it, and the patients have liked it. So we've really seen satisfaction by the providers and the patients in, in using this tool and using this as a way to provide care. Senator Roger Wicker commended Commissioner Carr and the FCC for their soft hand on Internet regulations, which he says allowed the United States to adapt to new challenges brought forth by the pandemic. He and his group in the FCC made a decision that some people felt was uh, controversial. I never did, but they embarked on the light touch approach to regulation of the Internet. And what that meant was people who've got a dollar to invest and want to take a chance in investing in this, in this wonderful phenomenon that still controls the world felt a little more comfortable building out and investing in a build out. And so when the pandemic hit and people in Europe were, have, were getting their communication shut down they had long periods, periods of time when they could not get the Internet connectivity. We never one time, one moment, one day had that problem in the United States. And so my hat is off to, uh, to the people um, at the FCC and to my colleagues in the United States Senate who supported us on that, who resisted the parade of horribles that never came true. And, um, and in an emergency, when usage went way, way up, way, way up, uh, the United States met the challenge. The senator has also recently spoken out against the corporate response to the new Georgia voting laws and, pardon me, and has championed some of the relief provided through the American Rescue Plan, despite voting against it earlier this year. He discussed his positions on the two issues with our Kobe Vance. They're perfectly within their rights to speak out, but I I think uh, I'm uh, perfectly within bounds to point out that they don't seem to, to understand the facts of the legislation in Georgia. I've looked very carefully at that statute. Uh, it expands the number of days for early voting, expands the number of drop boxes. It clarifies um, uh, the, the hours that uh, can be utilized, and I think the language would naturally lead to the hours being 8 to 5 in rural counties, but actually expanded to 7 p.m. In, in, um, in the urban counties. There's just nothing in the state statute to suggest that in any way it involves voter suppression. And, and it, I think it's wrong for them and the corporate boards to, for some reason, think there, there might be a business advantage uh, for, for them saying something that is uh, patently not the case. Uh, when it comes to the American Rescue Plan, I was curious what your thoughts on that are, and uh, I saw that... Uh, well, the, 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 the American Rescue Plan uh, is uh, $1.9 trillion. Um, we still had a trillion dollars to spend on COVID-19 relief from the five bills that were passed uh, by consensus... Um, during uh, 2020 and signed into law by President Trump. 
so it seemed it seemed to me excessive, um, and particularly in light of the fact that much of this money, which was called rescue money from COVID, will not be spent until the years uh, 2022 and beyond. Add to that the fact that um, everyone will have had an opportunity for a vaccine by uh, the end of May, 1st of June, and the pandemic seems to be subsiding. It just uh, seemed to me more of an excuse to um, to engage in a lot of, uh, of uh, Biden administration and uh, 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 left of center wish list rather than actually a rescue from um, from the, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, that's not to say there weren't a few things in the bill that we can all benefit from. Coming up, health officials provide updates on vaccine progress in the state. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. Mississippi's health leaders are calling on health care providers to help vaccinate more Mississippians. During a roundtable with the Mississippi Medical Association last week, state epidemiologist Dr. Paul Byers and state health officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs laid out a plan to get more vaccines to local providers. We've got a survey now that's going to be, it's going to open uh, every Friday morning and it'll close Thursday evening or Thursday afternoon. And that time frame for that survey is the time for enrolled providers to fill it out and tell us what vaccine they want and how much. And what we're asking is, is for providers to, to basically order on a weekly basis the amount of vaccine that they can get out the door within a week's time. And we want them to do that every week. So if you ordered you know, 100 doses for your clinic this week, and you need 100 more for the next week, do the same thing. You don't have to order second doses. Remember those second doses automatically come after you get the first doses. But we're gonna be sending out a HON today, this afternoon, again, gonna have this survey link on it and the instructions. And basically, if you're not an enrolled provider, there's instructions on here about how to be an enrolled provider. You gotta be enrolled to get vaccine. If you're in a clinic setting, we want to give you a vaccine. And so if you're a pharmacy, if you're a pharmacy, if you're a hospital that hasn't had vaccine, you know, anybody who wants to vaccinate their patient population um, and, and the public, let us know, ask us, and, and we will do our best to honor that request based on the availability and the amount of doses requested. It may not be exact. It may be that the doses are doses are reduced a little bit depending on our availability but we will do our best and so we don't if you don't ask we can't get it to you and we know that docs are the most trusted source for vaccine related information and what we're seeing is a lot of patients are waiting to get it in their doctor's office and so we need we need the doctor's help to, to, to take it into your clinic and get your folks protected Health leaders liken the path forward to a race between vaccinations and the development and spread of new variants. Dr. Paul Byers says most of the reported cases in Mississippi are from the original strain, but says there are rising numbers of variant cases in the state. The dominant strain is still the normal wild type, right? So it's not the variant strain. Um, But we are seeing an ever-increasing number of reports of variant strains that are especially as we've, we've really started ramping up our sequencing. There are a number of different sort of contracts and other agreements, um, and with our own capacity here at the public health lab as well. Um, but when you look at variant strains, I think we are somewhere in the range of, of 68 total variant cases identified in the state. And, and think about that in the context of, 
you know, we get we get somewhere between, I don't know, upwards of 300 new cases a day. And over the course of all of this time, you know, 70 cases, 68 cases, um, the vast majority of those are the UK variant, which is which is what is the predominant variant identified in the United States as well. Uh, some states more so than others. Um, but, you know, um, we've had a smattering of the California variant strains uh, and then just the one uh, South African variant, the, the 351 that we had a couple weeks ago. State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs says recent data shows the Pfizer vaccine maintains high efficacy against the South African variant. Coming up, violence is down in Mississippi prisons. We hear from the commissioner of MDOC. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. Violence at Mississippi prisons has gone down significantly, according to the Mississippi Department of Corrections. Both serious and minor infractions at Parchman fell by about 63 percent from 2019 to 2020. MDOC is reporting violence at all state prisons is down by 52 percent in the same time period. Statistics that include riots that occurred January 2020. Commissioner Burl Kane, who took over the department in May of 2020, tells our Becca Schimmel the drop is is a result of new strategies implemented to reduce incentives for gang activity. The stats don't lie. And that's what they show because of the number of write-ups and so forth have reduced. And there's several reasons. One is I can look at my mail and just comment about that. I'm not getting any complaints very much at all about medical, which is one thing I think we've solved. Also, the, uh, the food is coming well. And so that's all good. And, uh, we really took a hard lick at the gangs, and we hope that we're making some progress there. I think the smoking helped a lot because we killed off a lot of the economy of the gang, plus put that money in our own coffers to help with reentry. So that was a good move. So I think those are some of the reasons. Plus, we've worked with our staff. We've uh, worked really hard to, to, to use the, the old Dale Carnegie concept on our middle level managers to manage better and more efficiently. And we've been using Probation Pro to shake down and and get the contraband out of the prison. We we now don't have any more throwing over the fence, and so hadn't had any more drones. So we've done pretty good with all that. So I just think it's all coming together slowly but surely. You mentioned a couple of things. If you can clarify, um, you mentioned smoking. You also mentioned the food. Can you tell me what you've changed about those two things? Well, the smoking we started smoking, and so we started selling the tobacco ourselves, and and uh, the, before it was contraband, and it was hard to it was hard on the employees who did smoke and they couldn't bring cigarettes in and then they were tempted. And so then some of them quit. And that's probably one of the things that contributed to the short staff we have. And then uh, the economy of it was there because they were selling it. So we turned that economy into, into our economy. And so that's going to make a serious impact on how much money we have in the MMA welfare fund and so forth. We're also going to launch all our, our, our sports leagues. Coming up this spring, we're going to, as soon as we can get out with COVID, and another good thing is we've vaccinated all our prisoners at CMCF, all of them at, at SMCI and now Parchment, and we're moving on to the to the other to the other the uh, private prison and also the regionals. So we're going to be able to visit. We're going to be able to open up and have prison. We're going to have sports. We can get together and so forth, and it's going to be a lot safer. So that's that all makes them happy. They, they look forward to that. We have a sports league. We have a basketball league. We're going to play each other and have our own teams. And uh, like it used to be a long time ago, we have the arts and craft show planned for January, for, for October. And so that means you got to start making hobby crafts. We're busy, busy, busy people. That's good. I'm glad you said that about the vaccinations. And um, so I was going to ask you for an update on those. So you've got three of the prisons in the state fully vaccinated the inmates and the staff or as much as you're going to get. 
we have three of them and most all of them took the vaccination. I think we were over 90%. We didn't make anybody do it. But obviously if you don't do it, you're not gonna be able to visit because we don't want you to bring it into the ones who didn't take it. We wish everybody would take it. But uh, we, we gave everybody that took the vaccination a little bag of famous Amos cookies and you know, to kind of make you feel better for the shot because that could be the deal there. But anyway, uh, more are now stepping up to take it though. We could almost get to 100% at CMCF. Parchment's doing well too in SMCI, so they all, they're smart. They know they, they don't want to get to COVID. They want to visit and be able to move around with each other, so that's good. And uh, what have you changed about the food? You mentioned that earlier. Well, not because the other vendor, the private vendor, was, a, was bad or good, but the point is we wanted to cook our own food because we need to have cookies and things like that for special occasions, and as we have clubs and organizations and go to church and group. We need to have access to the kitchen for special meals and so forth. And, and with a contractor, that would cost extra money with us. It's just the materials. And so we're also going to really, really work with our, with our kitchen being a Votech school where we teach people to be short order cooks or work in restaurants and so forth. And we're going to have our inmate cooks in a separate dormitory so that they just focus on that and they can work. They have to start at three o'clock in the morning. They won't be disturbed and do their long shifts and, and I'll be together. And so we'll also keep them away from any gang activity and so forth. And I don't even like to call that word because we're going to be eliminating those as soon as we can, because we're just not going to put up with them and they're violent. And I've asked the parole board not to parole any gang member, because why would you turn someone that extorts people that robs and steals and court causes chaos? Why would you turn him back in the community? You do that. You're not looking out for the public. And so uh, just another uh, question about COVID-19. Do you know how many people have died in MDOC custody from COVID-19? I do now because we had a coroner's report that came in on some of the last ones. So we had five more to go to the 23. So we had 28, but we're still lower than our other companion states and so forth. A really, really good number, but I hate any number. I wish it was zero. But if some had to, that's the fewest I know of any other states around us. What do you think of the criminal justice reform bills that recently have been going through the legislature and, you know, could be on their way to the governor's desk? I think that the most important thing about criminal justice reform bill for us in Mississippi is when we get the gangs out of the prison, we get the prison calmed down, we have an atmosphere of rehabilitation and not violence, and we change the way we operate. We won't have nearly the problem to pass legislation for prison reform. And I tell this to the prisoners here, as long as we have the gangs and as long as we're having all the violence, as long as we get contraband, people are not going to want you out of prison. And so that's the whole deal. The public judges us by our behavior. And so it's all based on behavior, but you know what they did and their mental health status. And that's the other thing we're doing. We're really pushing really hard and focusing on mental health treatment big time especially with telemedicine. And so we don't have a psychiatrist, but we will soon, because if we have to have telemedicine, we'll have our psychiatrists there, but we're still gonna have the mental health treatment that is so necessary to get over our addiction. I say, I may right, maybe mine's eating too much, but anyway, we all have addictions. So we gotta get over our addiction so we can be healed and be well and be healthy and not be violent and live a good life. You've established hospice at previous prisons you've worked at, you've been, seems to be kind of an advocate of that. I was wondering if you support compassionate release of inmates who are terminally ill. The sentence is what the sentence is. The judge makes the sentence. I just keep the keys. And that's how that really works. So that's why we have hospice. So those folks with life sentences, and many times they've lived so long, their family's gone. They don't have any social security. They've been in prison. They don't have any way to make a living. They're old and they're getting feeble. So they need to have some way to, to die with dignity and not just be out there unloved and uncared for. So what we do with the moral rehabilitation, the seminaries, producing our own preachers, having our own churches, then we have community. And in that community, then hospice fits really well because those inmates are the caregivers and that's his friends and his families. And so then it makes a lot more compassionate at the end of life time. So sometimes to get out is not the best thing. It depends on the situation. That's where we count our own compassionate release. And maybe it's compassionate life more than release because sometimes release is not the best option. A lot of times.
Commissioner Burl Kane of MDOC with our Becca Schimmel. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.